Um, first of all, a reminder about the project. The design for the project uh, is, is due soon, I think in like two weeks. So ideally you would have already thought about what you want to do your project on and if you review the documents and, and so on. If you have not, you know, now is a good time to start. You don't want to probably let it go too much longer than this. Um, few things, make sure that you're clear on what you need to turn in for the first thing. It's, it's a document. It has four sections, plus it will have some sort of partially done web pages. That's what a prototype is. The web pages don't need to be completed, but the web pages should be um, sufficient enough so that I can look at it and get an idea of what your final project's going to look like. Think of it like a rough draft for a term paper. A rough draft for a term paper might not have all the detail that you're going to put in and might have some things, might have some grammatical, uh, grammatical errors or some spelling errors or whatever. So it might not be complete and it might not be perfect, but at least it lets me know that you're moving on the right track and, and, and um, that, that uh, you're moving in the right direction to get it finished. Now, in the real world, the purpose of a prototype is to get something in people's hands so that they can look at it and evaluate it. Uh, while the design document is valuable and it provides valuable information, a lot of times what really benefits people is if they actually see a working model of the final product. Then they can say, hey, that's, you know, um, it really doesn't make sense to have those links. We should have these links instead. Or... I don't like uh, that color scheme. I think we should have a brighter color scheme or a darker color scheme or whatever. So the design document is very important. Remember, the earlier you catch and correct any problems or oversights, the less expensive it is overall to correct them. All right? So if you haven't thought about that, please do and please ask any questions. Don't agonize over a topic. Pick something that you're interested in. Pick something that you think is going to be fun. But again, don't sit there thinking and, and agonizing over what's going to be the ideal or the perfect topic. Just, just pick something. And um, I've never, you know, chances are whatever you pick is, is going to be appropriate. The only consideration might be that you might pick a topic that's too broad or you might pick a topic that's too narrow. In which case, we can talk about it and figure out a way to either narrow down the topic or expand the topic so it gets to be the right size. So by all means, bring that to class. If you have questions, send me emails and so on. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is putting things in different folders. All right? Let's go and let's create a web page. Um. I'm just looking for an image to use. All right, I'm going to go in and create a folder on my desktop, and I am going to put everything in there. And again, as we get to having larger sites with multiple files and multiple, you know, multiple images, CSS files, or HTML files, the best thing to do is to create a single folder, put all your stuff in it. Then when you're done, compress that folder and upload it. That will guarantee that 
I'll get everything. Um, from time to time, I'll get where people will send me their HTML page, but not send me the CSS uh, file. Or they'll send me the HTML and the CSS and not send me the image files or whatever. All right. So it's important to, to send everything. The other thing it's important to do is to not use what's called the absolute path of the file. In other words, where it says C colon backslash um, program file slash user slash mzeller slash that sort of thing. You don't use that because if you put it on a web server, that file location doesn't exist. Typically for this class, we're going to use what are called relative paths where you give the path to a file in relation to the web page. So let me show you what I mean by that. So I'll go in here and I'll create my HTML document. And I'm going to go in here and put my standard tags that you would see on most pages. Then I'm going to put the header. It's just going to be single page, so I'm going to skip the navigation. I did close the body tag, and I didn't even start it yet. Oh my goodness, it's been a long break. I have to say, doing this job has made me appreciate chefs on TV that talk while they're cooking. Because it's, it's hard like for me like to do typing like at one time while I'm talking about something else. You know, it's, it's easy to get distracted and all that. And at least with me, you know, if I make a mistake, it's just going to be a typo. You know, it's not going to be like a chef who, if they're chopping carrots or something, They'll be able to chop their finger off or something. So. All right, there I put my credit down here in a little paragraph. All right. Now, I might have a paragraph about the Flemish giant. Oh, I'll type in everything I know about Flemish giants. They're big bunnies. And then we have an image. And again, if the image is in the same folder as... as the HTML file, all I need to do is specify the name of the file and just make sure that I have the proper extension. So I'm going to rename this to just rabbit, just so that I don't have so much to type in. And if it's in the same folder, I will do source equals rabbit.jpg 
Again, it's important to know the precise file extension because even a JPEG file could have several extensions. It could be .jpg, it could be .jpeg, and so on. So you want to make sure you get the exact file extension. All right. The other thing about images is we want an alt attribute. And the idea of an alt attribute is that if someone is using the web page, if someone is accessing the web page using assistive technology, such as a screen reader, um, people that are visually impaired and people that are, are blind will sometimes have a, a narrator read the screen to them. The idea of an alt attribute is you explain a little bit of what's in the picture so that the person at least gets a sense of what's going on on the page with the picture. I mean, obviously, you know, no description is going to be so complete that it's going to take the place of being able to see the picture, but at least you can provide some sort of explanation to people that are visually impaired so they know um, what the content of the page is. In this case, I'm giving a little bit longer explanation to sort of explain the gist of the picture. The reason of this picture is to show that, hey, the rabbit's bigger than the kid is, right? So I can put that in the alt attribute so that someone that's accessing this page via screen reader gets the sense that, oh, yeah, we're talking about a big bunny here. We're not talking about some little tiny bunny that can sit in your hand or something like that. All right, so if we look at this now, I'm going to go and save this. And I'm going to put it in my examples folder. And if we view it, there's our web page. Okay, now, at some point, if we start adding web pages, you know, let's say we had a whole website about the different kinds of pets that you could have, you know, cats and dogs and rabbits and fish and birds and, and ocelots and all these other things. If we started doing that, then our directory would get pretty crowded, just like your folders on your own home machine, you know. You might have, for example, a folder for your work stuff, a folder for your school stuff, maybe a folder for your personal finances and so on. Because if you put everything in the same folder, then it's tough to find everything and it gets to be a real pain. Everything's all mixed up and things aren't organized. So you can organize pages or files on a web server in the same way. You can create different folders. And a lot of times what you will do is you'll have the main folder that contains your web pages. You'll then have a folder for images. Then you might have a separate folder for style sheets and for JavaScript and things like that. Now again, that, a lot of that depends on how big of a site that you're talking about. If you have a massive site, for example, like like a site like Lorraine Community site where there's literally hundreds of pages, there might be different folders for each section of the site. So there may be the main folder for sort of the home page and the things associated with that. Then there might be a, um, a, a separate folder that contains financial aid information, right? So all the pages in the financial aid section of the site might be in a folder. All the pages about engineering, business, and IT might be in a folder. All the, uh, all the pages about um, the nursing program might have its own folder and so on down the line. So again, you organize it in a way that makes sense for the particular site that you're dealing with and how many pages there are and how many files there are and so on. Again, most of the sites that we're dealing with in this class are relatively small, so a good organization would be to have 
your HTML page is in sort of the main folder, which typically they call the root folder. And then underneath it have a separate folder for images and maybe a separate folder for CSS files and then maybe later on as we get into JavaScript, maybe a separate folder for those. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I'm going to pretend that, hey, I have a lot of files. So I'm going to create a separate folder for images. And then I'm going to move the picture into images. When I do that, it doesn't work anymore. All right. In fact, I see the alt description, which is sort of a second purpose for the alt description. If for whatever reason the image can't load, it will, it will display a, a little caption about what the image is. All right. But notice I get a broken image. All right. So. What I have to do is I have to reflect the new path to the image because just using the file name only works if the file is in the same folder as the web page. So now that I've removed that rabbit.jpg and put it in a separate folder, that image is no longer in the same folder as the web page. It's in a subfolder called images. So I'm going down to the images folder, and that's where the rabbit image is. So, I would need to change the URL to be images slash rabbit. Now, a couple things here. There's no slash at the beginning, and that indicates that wherever my starting point is, wherever my page is, I'm going to go in a folder underneath that. So. Here's where my page is. Images is in the same folder, so I go into that folder, images, and there is my page. So images slash rabbit.jpg. <coughs> now, one thing to notice, by the way, especially if you've done a lot of work with Windows or done some operating system stuff, it's not the backslash. It's not that even though that's what typically is used in Windows. This is, this is web land. This is not Windows land. <laughs> All right? And the, uh, the, the, the separator for directories or folders in web land is always a forward slash. It doesn't matter if we're in Windows or Mac or Linux or, or anything. It's always going to be the forward slash. So now I go images slash rabbit. Notice I don't do this and put this in there. I get a lot of students that do that. They put the full path in there. Now, the problem of that is, is what happens when I download this to grade it on my machine? Do I have a C fold, uh, do I have a C drive that has a users folder, that has a lab instructor folder, that has a desktop folder, blah, 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 blah. I'll give you a hint. No, I don't, because I typically grade things on a Mac. All right? So I don't no such thing as a C drive on a Mac. All right? So I don't have that. So that's why instead you use this is called the relative path. And even irrespective of grading, that would literally only work on your machine. So if you finish this web page and put it up on a web server, if you uploaded it for a web server so the whole world could see this site, then people wouldn't be able to view that image because they would not have that folder existing on their machines. So you use a relative path. And now we should be now that I save it like this, we should be back in business. And sure enough, we are. Now, what if it's two folders deep? In other words, what if I have a lot of images? You know, I'm doing a pet store, so I have uh, dozens of images of dogs, dozens of images of cats, dozens of images of rabbits. 
Well, then I can break it down even further if I want. And I can go in here and say, have a folder for all my rabbit images. What do you suppose I would do then there? Put the next folder. So images slash rabbits slash rabbit.jpg. And again, still works. All right. So we're using what's called, and if you've done like the operating system class or ever done any sort of command line stuff, all right, this is known as a relative path. You go from the path from one directory to the other. And this is pretty much, this will do you about 80% of the time. There's only a couple of little curves that, that you run into. For example, what if the image happened to be in a folder above where the page is? So what if, let me, let me draw this. What if I had, here's my root folder. What if the situation was reversed, where instead of the image being in a folder below the page, the image was in a folder above the page. So the rabbits was in, the rabbits.html was in the folder, not that. Well, again, how would you get from here to here? You go up to the parent folder. And that would be done with a dot dot. So if I had these reversed, and the web page was in a folder underneath the image, then I'd use dot dot. If it was two folders deep, I'd do dot dot slash dot dot slash the name of that. Now again, this isn't done every day. depends on the particular kind of site that you have and so on. Um, then you have the trickiness of what happens if you have something like this. I have my root folder and I have a page here and a page folder. And I have an image in here. Well, I have to go up from the page folder to the root and then down to the images folder and, oh, I'm sorry. This should be logo.jpg. Try this again. What happens if I have my root folder and I have a directory for the page And I have a directory for the image. And I want to get from here to here. I can't cut across folders. I have to go up to the root and then down the image. And so my SRC in that case would be dot dot slash image slash logo dot jpeg. Now, where you run into this sometimes would be if I had my CSS in a separate folder. So I could do something like this. I could have my root folder, and I could have my page here. I could have a CSS folder here that contains my CSS file, and I could have an images folder here that contains my logo. Well, in the index, I would refer to the style as saying, as being equal to CSS slash style dot CSS. 
In other words, I'm from this folder, I go down to the CSS folder, and that's my file. If the HTML referred to the image, I would do SRC equals images slash logo dot JPEG. Now here's the sort of twist, plot twist, if you will. What if I used a background image in the CSS file? Well, I would have to point to the image here, so I'd have to go up to the root, then down to the image. So if the background of something was the logo, I would have to say background URL dot dot slash images slash logo dot JPEG. Here's the good news. The good news if this got confusing about 10 minutes from you and you sort of lost what I was saying. The good news is, is that you can just keep everything in the same folder. Then you just refer to it by the file name. And I won't think any less of you. <laughs> All right? I really won't. But you should know that you also can divide the folders. And then, again, a typical good way to divide them would be to have a separate folder for your images. So maybe you have all your CSS pages and web pages in one folder, and underneath it you have an images folder. And then to refer to the images, you just put images slash and then the name of the image. And if you do that, you should be set most of the time. If you want to do anything more complicated, I can review it with you in an individual basis. Uh, again, um, depending on, well, no. I, I, if you are a CISS major, you will take the operating systems class. And in the operating system class, you spend a lot of time studying relative paths, like dot, dot, slash, blah, 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 blah. Same thing, exact same thing. So you'll get more practice of this if you want to do anything a little more involved at some point. Any questions about this? All right, moving right along. Browser compatibility. <coughs> now we talked about browser compatibility. In a nutshell, the idea of browser compatibility is that each web browser that a person might use is a different program. And a web browser is responsible for displaying web pages. And web browsers, even though they're big and complicated programs, were written by humans just like you. And they were written by humans that have deadlines just like you. That leads to a not perfect situation. The situation is further muddled because the specifications for HTML evolve over time. They're always adding things and they're changing things. You know, there was HTML4 and then they added HTML5. And the thing is, is they didn't add HTML5 all at once. They started adding things and then changing things and then adding things and so on. So browser makers are, are working, uh, are, are aiming at a moving target. So they're aiming at a moving target. They have deadlines and they're humans. They're not going to come up with a perfect piece of software, just like nothing in this world is perfect. Now, here's the problem, though. All right? The problem is the browser is displaying your web page, and you want your web page to look the way that you want it to look like, regardless of the shape that the browser is in. So it's your responsibility to ensure some degree of browser compatibility. Now, what do I mean by browser compatibility? I mean that the page should be workable in as many different browsers as possible. Now, how far back do you go as far as versions of browsers and testing it? That's a judgment call. All right. Um, how do you test this? We looked at some online testing before the end of uh, uh, the first half of the semester, before spring break. Um, we also um, 
talked about having a little uh, testing lab set up where you have different versions of browsers and so on and test it. Um, the bottom line is you, you pay very close attention to browser testing. Now we talked about two special cases, earlier versions of Firefox and earlier versions of Internet Explorer. And for those we talked about having a couple of little fixes that don't make the browser completely HTML5 compatible, but at least makes it more HTML5 compatible. So the one thing that you should have on all of your web pages for the foreseeable future are these little fixes. Sometimes things like this are called hacks. I've heard them called kluges, um, shims, shivs, a lot of different names to them. Think of these as being the duct tape of the programming world, all right? In other words, <laughs> your radiator falls off your car, now the best thing to do would be to take it to a mechanic and get it fixed, right? Well, we don't operate in a perfect world, so what's the next best thing? Just duct tape it back on. I'm just joking about that. Duct taping your radiator back on probably isn't a good idea. I don't know anything about cars, but I'm guessing that's not a good idea, all right? Uh, may, maybe, maybe I should just change that example so I don't get people yelling. Uh, uh, if, your, if your rear view mirror falls off, let's say, that's maybe a little safer. Uh, even that probably isn't a good idea, but, but uh, more so. So, sort of the duct tape of Sort of the duct tape of the web world is these little things here. So I'm going to put that in my page. There's, there's two things. One of them is a fix for Firefox and one of them is a fix for earlier versions of Internet Explorer. So I would put this before your style sheets, these two things. And again, all they are is the Firefox fix. All it does is it says header, sections, footers, assize, navs, mains, articles, and figures, I want to treat as a block tag. The earlier versions of Firefox didn't know what those tags were. This explains to them, hey, these tags are all block tags. The Internet Explorer fix essentially does the same thing, but it accomplishes it via JavaScript. Without going into the technical details, it effectively does the same thing. It, it teaches Internet Explorer that those new HTML5 tags are actually block tags, so it knows how to handle them. So, Again, doesn't make it fully HTML5 compatible, but it at least it, it does some of the most basic HTML5 stuff. That is, it allows you to use those article tags, header tags, footer tags, and so on. So that's the first step to browser compatibility. A second test is running your code through a validator. Now, what is a validator? 
You can think of a validator as being sort of a grammar check for your web page. Except it's not looking at English grammar, like it's not looking to see like if you've used the, the right nouns and verbs and other words, all right? It's looking to make sure that you follow the rules, follow the grammar, the rules of HTML. So, these validators live on this website, w3c.org. <coughs> w3c.org, the W3C, is the organization, the World Wide Web Consortium, is the organization that defines HTML. These are the guys that made up the rules of HTML and any enhancement to HTML, like HTML5. They also define CSS and any enhancements to CSS. So this is like the official grammar police, if you will, of HTML. These are the people that invented the language. All right, so this is the definitive source. There's other great sources on the web that can teach you HTML or give you examples or give you CSS examples, but these are the folks that invented it. So they are the authorities. Now if you look along the side here, there are validators, and I'm going to click on the HTML validator. Now, you can validate your web page a couple different ways. You can put in the URL. So if your website was out on the web, you could go and validate CNN.org or CNN.com. Or let's do eBay. So I could go in here and type in HTTP, and it will go and it will validate eBay, and it will tell me if there's any errors on eBay. And there is. Actually, quite a few. There's on Amazon. Okay. But you can check it that way. Let's check their own page. Boy, I'd be embarrassing if there were errors on their page, right? But there isn't. Ah, so you get the little green line, and they follow XHTML 1.0 strict. That's again, that's a different sort of dialect of HTML, but their page validates. It validates correctly. You want to see that green bar on the top of the page when you go to validate. Now the other thing you could do is you could upload a file. So I could go click and I could upload the file. Or the other thing, what I usually do is I usually just paste my code into here. So I can go in here and I can go and say select all paste my code in here, and then click Validate.
think I forgot to close my link tag. One thing I will say is it doesn't necessarily give you the answer in a very direct way. It points to where it thinks it is a problem. And keep in mind this is a computer doing the checking for you. All right, This is not a, a person that um, has judgment. So we'll see some examples. I want to get, get a perfect page correct first and then we'll go and we'll intentionally make some mistakes. So we'll show you the kind of errors that it gives you. So there's actually two things it doesn't like about this. It doesn't like this, which I'm not really sure why, because that sure looks right to me. But I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to take out that line of code. Oh, it's in the wrong place. I put it in the header, not in the head. There we go. It doesn't like the fact that I don't have any H2s in the article. So I'm going to go in and I'll put in an H2 in here. The yellow things are warnings. That's kind of like, in English, you know, some people say don't end a sentence with a preposition. It's not really a rule, but some people consider that poor practice. Same idea here. So I don't have to do that, but it's telling me that, yeah, I probably want to have an H2 in here. So let's go and check this, and voila. I don't have any errors or warnings. So I get that green bar, all right? So I made sure it works. So what have I done? Have I guaranteed that it's going to work correctly in every browser? Unfortunately not. Why not? Well, because browser makers are imperfect. And even though I did my job and I created a web page that is grammatically correct, there might be some quirk in the browser that doesn't display it exactly the way I intended. But I've taken a good first step in ensuring it. Because if I make sure that I've, I've followed the rules, that increases my chances that it will be compatible. So I haven't guaranteed it. I still need to test across multiple browsers. But I've gone in the right direction where, yeah, there's, there's a better chance now that it's going to work across any browsers. Now let's go and let's look at some errors that could exist. Let me move this H2 from here to here. That's clearly not correct, right? Because it's no longer nested properly. All right? The H2 ends within the paragraph and it didn't start within the paragraph. So let's go and let's validate it again. It gives me two errors that, given that I know what I did, they make sense, but reading these errors takes a little bit of practice. So what it tells me, it tells me the element P is not allowed as a child element of H2 in this context. Then it tells me it's suppressing further errors from this subtree. Because a lot of times with errors in HTML, there's sort of a snowball effect. One mistake that you make sort of gets compounded 
and actually creates a number of different errors. It's just showing me the first error, hoping that I can figure out and correct that. So what it's telling me is that actually, according to the rules of HTML, you're not allowed to start a paragraph within an H2 tag. And that's what I did. My H2 tag st uh, starts here, and then I have my paragraph starting here. So really, the problem is that the ending H2 tag is in the wrong place. But the browser doesn't see it that way. The browser simply tells me something that's close to the error that I'm getting, that's close to the error that I'm having, but not precisely the way that I would view the error. So you have to do a little bit of interpretation. Then it actually gives me a second error saying no P element in scope but an end P tag scene. In other words, they're ignoring this start P tag because it's in the wrong place and all of a sudden now they see an ending P tag and they don't know what to do with it. An important thing is to realize is one mistake that you make could actually generate a bunch of different errors because those tags get perceived as being in the wrong order. It gives everything that's wrong with it. And again, it doesn't differentiate and it, it's not able to, to judge to say, hey, you made this mistake. It just knows that tags aren't where they're supposed to be. And every tag that it sees that it's not supposed to be in the right place, it gives you an error on. All right. So the bottom line is it sort of points you in the right direction. And ideally, you're able to look at it then and sort of figure out what is wrong with it. So in this case, hey, it tells me I'm not allowed to start a P within an H2. Oh, the problem is, is that the H2 should have ended. If I forget, let's say I forget the source attribute of this. It'll tell me. This, this error, it actually gives me pretty obvious error description. The element IMG is missing the required attribute source. So I have to go and put that back in. Now the thing to realize is this is like running your term paper through spell check or through grammar check in Word. Doesn't mean that you have a good term paper just because grammatically it's correct. I could still write nonsense in my term paper. I could still write stuff that isn't true or stuff that's illogical or whatever. So this doesn't guarantee that you have a good page. This guarantees that you, your page has followed the rules of HTML. All right? And that's a good starting point as far as ensuring browser compatibility. It's not an ending point, but it's a starting point. All right? Certainly you want to have your page as correct as possible, um, you know, in, in, before you go and, and start testing it. This is something ideally that you would not wait until you were all done with your page and then test it. As you make enhancements to your page, as you're building your template, you would test your template. You would test your template by running it through the validator and you would test your template by running it in different browsers to make sure that it looks correct. Um, I've been on a lot of projects where people don't do any cross-browser uh, uh, testing until they're, very, they're, they're absolutely done with the project. And they're in for a lot of nasty surprises at that point. This is especially true in the old days, like back... Um, I'm thinking of some old projects I worked on in the early 2000s where there were big, big browser compatibility issues and browsers were not as good as they are now. All right? um, you would run something back in those days in Netscape versus Internet Explorer and get a world of difference. Well, yeah, if you wait until the end and test it, you're liable to find all sorts of problems. That's why it's best to do browser compatibility testing as you go along. Now there is also testing for CSS.
And it works sort of the same way. On the W3C web, uh, homepage, there's a CSS validator. You can paste in your CSS code, do a check, and it will tell me, hey, there's no errors found with that. All right. <coughs> This is a good tool to use if your page doesn't look the way that you think it should look. If you're debugging your CSS, if you think you've done your CSS right, but it doesn't display the way that you expected it to, all right, run your CSS through the validator. That way it will notice a, a missed colon or a missed semicolon or something like that. Something that you're liable to, if you've been staring at the code for a long time, you're liable to overlook. But it's not going to get tired and overlook errors like that. It's going to be able to spot them. So this is a good debugging technique. The other debugging technique that I recommend with CSS is to put colors on the page, even if you're not going to permanently have those colors, but make different sections of your page like really different colors so they really stand out. That way you can get a sense of what's going on on the page and how the browser sees the page. And that oftentimes is useful in debugging. All right. So these are some sort of loose ends. Um, I cover them usually at different points each semester, wherever it seems to fit in. On Wednesday, we will start talking about making your web pages compatible for mobile devices. And what are some of the techniques we can do? We're not going to cover that in a comprehensive way. But we're going to talk about sort of the, 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 the approach that you can take, and then we'll start talking about some of the other more advanced techniques um, that you can pursue that we won't go into detail into this class. All right, questions? All right, we'll see you in lab.